Welcome to EPG Patshala in Computer Science series of uh, lectures on computer networks. So, we have been looking at some wireless uh, networks and wireless technologies. So, as part of uh, looking at some common wireless technologies, we will be looking at Bluetooth today. So, we will look at the Bluetooth protocol, the various components that are there in Bluetooth, how the connection is set up in Bluetooth and other details of this particular protocol. So, Bluetooth as we all know, it is used for very uh, short range communication between mobile phones, PDAs, notebook computers and so on with other personal or peripheral devices. Basically, the idea is to replace cables and uh, which are connecting electronic devices. Okay. So, it operates in the license exempt band of at uh, 2.45 gigahertz with FHSS frequency hopping spread spectrum. Uh, the range is limited to only about 10 meters. And the uh, communication devices typically belong to um, one individual or group, which is why we sometimes refer to it as personalized area networks or PANs. Okay. And uh, now you have uh, version 2.0, for instance, support speeds of up to 2.1 megabit per second. One of the key factors of this is very low power consumption. So, that is the uh, very uh, important characteristic of the Bluetooth uh, technology. Okay. So, the Bluetooth. Um, um, Specification actually is given by uh, an industry consortium which is called as the Bluetooth uh, special interest group okay. and what they specify is not just um, a layer 2 kind of mechanism or the link layer mechanism, but a complete suite of protocols, entire suite of protocols including application uh, protocols which are, the, which are which they refer to as application profiles. So, these application profiles for instance could um, specify how to synchronize a PDA with a personal computer or you could have another profile which talks about how to connect a mobile computer um, with a wired LAN and so on, right. So, this, so you have different application profiles which are specified as part of this Bluetooth. So, coming to the Bluetooth technology per se, um, the term that is used when two or more devices share the same channel to talk to each other that is called as a Pico net, okay. It is a Pico net that is formed. So, the Pico net normally consists of a master device and slave devices. Now, it can have up to seven slave devices. And any communication is only between the master and the slave, okay. The slaves do not communicate directly with each other, right. So, they will, if at all they have to talk to each other, it will have to be through the master. Uh, a slave can be also in, in a state called parked, which means that it can be set to an inactive low power state. Now, this is important because power consumption is one of the key features of the Bluetooth protocol, okay. So, then we can also have two or more pico nets which are interconnected to form what is called as a scatter net. So, you can see this. Uh, there are two different things which are interconnected to each other. So, that is also a possibility that we have, okay. So, this is your uh, one master here connected to this Pico net, this handling this Pico net and it is connected to this Pico net. So, this interconnection is referred to as a scatter net. Okay. So, now we talked about a master and a slave. See, these are two important components here. So, what is this master device supposed to do? Uh, the master device in a Pico net is the one whose clock and the hopping sequence the it has a free frequency hopping uh, mechanism that we said is used. So, the hopping sequence the different frequencies that are used right. So, that hopping sequence um, and the clock okay of this particular master device is what is used to synchronize all the other devices which are there in the Pico that is all the other slaves. So, it also carries out what is called as the paging procedure and the connection establishment. We will be looking at how the paging and connection establishment are done shortly okay. So, you can look at it as saying that it allows the uh, slave devices to connect to it, identify where the slave device is and be able to send data to it. So, that is what we mean by this process, okay. Now, the slave devices, they are defined as those units which are synchronized to the master via the master's clock and hopping sequence. And after connection establishment, the slaves are normally assigned a temporary 3 bit number, okay, which is, so you can see um, 3 bit number would mean that you can have go only from 0 to 7, which is why we have about 7 devices which are supported in the um, in a, in a Pico net, okay. So, it is basically to reduce the number of addressing bits that are required. Okay. So, now when, when you talk of these Pico nets, so it is essentially a master slave, rela stay, slave relationship that is supported. So, a Bluetooth uh, device can either function as a master or as a slave. You would have seen this when you are uh, for instance using Bluetooth to connect up to uh, mobile devices, right. One can access will act as a master, the other can act as a slave. Any of them can act as a master and any of them can act as a slave. And a Pico net is formed when you have um, the network with one master and more than one or more uh, slaves, okay. And each Pico net is defined by a different hopping channel to which the users will synchronize to, okay. And as and each Pico net has a maximum capacity of about one uh, megabit per second. Now, of course, you have slightly higher data rates are supported. 
and the uh, hopping pattern is determined by the master ok. This is the, so if you look at a piconet structure typically, um, so the you can have a master and then you could have an active slave, you could have parked slave and you could have other slaves which are at a standby mode of operation as well ok. okay. So now coming to different um, link types that are supported ok, at the physical link there are two types of physical links that are supported on uh, 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 in Bluetooth. So one is called as a synchronous connection oriented link, so what we mean by this is that you have a point to point full duplex connection between the master and the slave. So this is established once by the master and kept alive till the till it is released by the master ok. So this is typically used for sending voice connections, so to guarantee continuity but so once you are connected you maintain that synchronized synchronous uh, communication ok. So what happens here is um, now since uh, Bluetooth actually uses a uh, time division multiplexing or duplexing kind of uh, operation to uh, use the channel. So the master which means there will be slots in which the data transfers will take place. So the master will reserve slots which are used for the SEO link so that um, you can make sure that you are able to preserve any uh, time sensitive information, you are able to give some guarantees for sending the time sensitive information which is why we said it is normally used for audio, video and so on. Then you have another link called the asynchronous connection link, uh, this is a momentary link between the master and the slave, so no reservation of slots takes place here and it can also be a point to multi point connection ok, so symmetric as well as asymmetric links are possible which means one direction could be different data rate and other could be different data rates and so on ok. So if you look at the um, ACL, the asynchronous connection list is designed basically for data traffic and uh, packet switch connection where data is exchanged sporadically as and when data becomes available ok. So uh, data integrity in this case is normally checked through some error checking and a retransmission is done if there is an error and normally there is one ACL link between a master and a slave ok, so that is what happens in ACL. In SEO, the synchronous connection oriented mechanism, this as we said is intended for time bounded information such as audio or video right, so it provides you can say a circuit switch kind of a connection where data is regularly exchanged, it is not um, actual circuit switching but you can look at it as something which like circuit, circuit switching which is able to provide you the guarantee that you will get a slot for the data to be sent. So here retransmission is not necessary, so it is not because normally it is expected for real time data ok and you have can have up to 3 SEO links per piconet right, so that is the two different uh, links that are supported. Now coming to the protocol stack that we have in Bluetooth, as we said uh, Bluetooth specifies not just a link layer protocol but an entire stack of protocols ok, starting from the application layer, so at the application layer uh, you can have different profiles, so different software modules that are there. And then you have, uh, you can see there is an there is an SDP protocol, there is a PPP, RF COM, HCI control and, and uh, data right. So all these are different protocols that you have um, at, at you can say at a higher level. So the L2, um, ok, so then the HCI control is used for um, to control the Bluetooth, it is the interface to control the Bluetooth chip, uh, SDP is a service uh, discovery protocol, it is used to uh, query the peer devices to, to, uh, to discover and, peri and the query the peer devices. Um, RFCOM is used as a uh, to, to emulate RS232 cable connection ok, that is the purpose of the RF, RFCOM uh, protocol here right and the L2 cap that is used for channel establishment for higher layer protocols and this set that you have here link manager protocol baseband and RF right, so the LMP this link manager protocol is used for the uh, that is the one that is used for the baseband link configuration management. So baseband uh, is used for device discovery and link establishment and RF of course uh, takes care of the radio characteristics. So this is basically these are normally implemented on the Bluetooth chip as such and the others are available as software modules, so that is um, normally how this protocol will be implemented ok. So this uh, lower category here, this, this uh, box here plus the L2 cap audio right, that is normally referred to as the transport protocol group. So the RF module here is responsible for sending and receiving uh, modulated bit streams. So baseband as we said is responsible for defining the timing, framing, flow control on the link and so on. Link manager is responsible for managing the connection states and for enforcing fairness among the slaves and for doing power management. And then you have also have a logical link control and adaptation protocol, the LL cap. So this is used for handling multiplexing of higher level protocols. And then similarly segmentation and reassembly of larger packets at the higher levels, so segmentation and reassembly will be handled by this LLCAP protocol 
and it is also responsible for device discovery and quality of service. Okay. So, you can see that we have actually a set of protocols which work together in order to provide the Bluetooth services. So, if you look at the packet structure, each packet actually is a um, small packet that we have. So, you can see that there is uh, it starts off with a 72 bit access code and then you have 54 bits of a header and that is followed by a payload. The size of the payload is variable from 0 to 2744 bits. Okay. So, this payload could be used to carry voice. Now, we said that if it is voice that is being carried, normally it is real time data. So, you will not have any um, error checking mechanism. So, no CRC will be used and no retries and retransmissions will be normally used with voice. Whereas, when you are using other data, uh, for other data you will have a header and you will have a CRC. So, which means you will do a CRC check and there will be an automatic repeat request for and retransmissions will be done and you can also have a frame um, uh, FEC which is which is an uh, optional mechanism. Okay. So, this is the normal structure of a, um, of a uh, Bluetooth packet. Okay. So, now we talked about something called an access code. right? So, what would this access code uh, consist of and what is its purpose? Uh, purpose of the access code is basically to provide synchronization, identification and signaling. Okay. So, if you look at different uh, types of uh, codes, access codes that we have, we have something called a channel access code. So, CAC. So, the channel access code identifies a particular PicoNet. It is a PicoNet identifier kind of a thing. Okay. Then you have a device access code. So, this is used for signaling procedures like paging, response paging and so on. Okay. We will see what is meant by paging and all quickly. Then there is something called an inquiry access code or IAC. Uh, so, in inquiry access code, we have uh, two access code, one called a general IAC, GIAC, which is common to all devices. And there is something called a dedicated IAC, which is for a particular dedicated group of Bluetooth devices. So, that is called as a DIAC. Okay. Right. So, if you look at the um, how the connection is established, there is a interesting uh, state machine that is used to control how the master and the slaves talk to each other, how they uh, discover each other, how they connect to each other and uh, start sending data. Okay. So, you can see that these are various uh, states, there are many other substates also which are used along with this. So, major states as such will be, it could be in a standby state and or it could be an inquiry state. This inquiry and page are on its way to get to go to the connected state. So, from the state standby state through an inquiry and a page state, it moves into the connected state. So, in the connected state, um, it could either have, it could be in a mode where it is parked or in a mode called hold state or in something called a sniff state. Okay. These are other possibilities that you have and it, it will be transmitting data and once it is done with that, it will go back to the, it can go back to the standby state. Okay. So, we will look at some of the details of how these things take place now. Okay. That is a very interesting aspect of this. Okay. So, now we said there are some substates that we have, right, when we talk about this inquiry and so on. So, inquiry basically is to identify, inquire and find out which are the devices which are available in that region. Okay. So, we have something called an inquiry scan which is used for that purpose. So, uh, what uh, is actually happens in the inquiry scan is that a device that wants to be discovered, which means a device may also choose not to be discovered. Okay. So, a, dis a device which wants to be discovered will periodically enter into this mode and it will listen for inquiry packets. So, it is scanning for inquiry packets to come. Okay. That is what we mean by an inquiry scan uh, state. So, the inquiry state is a state where the device will send an inquiry packet. Now, this inquiry packet will be addressed either to the general uh, access code or it will be for a dedicated uh, IAC, okay, so inquiry access code. Now, this transmission will be repeated on the inquiry hop, uh, on the inquiry hop sequence of frequencies, which means it is not just once that will be sent, it will actually be sent on a sequence of frequencies, okay, that is a, a very interesting part of this. And in response to this, there will be an inquiry response which will be sent. So, this is uh, sent by the device which, which, is in, which is being inquired, right. So, which means when an inquiry message is received by a node which is in the inquiry scan state, it forms what is called as a response packet, an FHS uh, packet, which contains the responding device address, okay. And it will be sent after a random number of slots, okay. So, that is what will happen in the inquiry response uh, state. Now, the main idea that is used behind this inquiry state, if you see, is this um, use of various frequencies. Okay. So, we said that the inquiring device will send out an inquire um, sequence right, or an inquire message as such on 16 different frequencies, so which is called as a 16 channel train, okay. that is the term that is used. So, the receiver which is in, which is actually in a standby mode, moves to a perform, performs an, in, uh, moves to an inquire scan mode okay. and, it rem, and it performs an inquire scan 
for a period which is long enough to be able to get this in this uh, scanning that is taking place right. So, long enough for an inquiring device to send that inquire on the 16 frequency. So, it should be able to receive those uh, inquire messages that are being sent ok. So, the receiver will, do, will do an inquire scan frequently enough. So, that it is guaranteed to wake up during a 16 channel train. So, receiver, remember the receiver can go to a, a standby or a sleep mode right. So, it should be able to come back and connect when, when somebody is inquiring to find out if some nodes are available it should be able to connect to that ok. So, that is the reason it why it will frequently move into an inquire scan state, look for inquire messages and then go back to its normal state or a standby state ok. So, you can see that uh, what will normally happen you have different slots as we said. So, there will be um, and you can see that the inquiry channel will happen on different uh, uh, frequency channels. So, you will have first on channel 1 then channel 2 channel 3 and so on right. So, different slots ok. So, that is the way it will be transmitted ok. So, we, we talked about the inquiry response right. So, when the radio when a device receives the inquire, so it will wait for some time between 0 to 0 0.32 seconds before it sends out its response packet. Now, why should it wait for a random amount for this random amount of time between 0 and 0 0.32 seconds? Again, this is to make sure that you avoid collisions because remember when a inquire is sent, more than one device could be responding to it. So, if more than one device is responding and both respond simultaneously, a collision will occur. So, to avoid the collision, they use a random period to respond to this particular inquire message. So, this FHS packet will consist of a device ID and a clock ok that is the that is the information that is required to uh, connect to the uh, to, un, to kind of identify that particular device ok. So, after the inquiring radio right is done with the inquiring procedure what will happen is it will have got the FHS packets from all the nodes which are responding to its inquire. So, it will know the um, radios it will know the IDs of all the devices which are within its within that particular range. Okay. So, that is uh, what you have. So, this is typically what an inquiry um, message will look like ok. So, this device let us say is a master which is sending out an inquire message right. So, it will see that it will keep sending out inquire messages with maybe with higher this thing. So, the moment it its range covers certain other devices. Now, these devices will receive this inquire message. So, when they receive the inquire message right. So, they will send back an inquiry response ok. So, that is to indicate that they have now send this inquiry response to this particular device. So, they are their information is now available with this master that you have here. Okay. So, then after the inquiry happens now with the inquiry what has happened is that it has just discovered the different devices. You still not decided whether you are going to start talking to those devices as such ok. So, that happens only in the next phase where we use what is called as a page uh, mechanism ok. So, what happens in the page uh, state is that the master will use that clock information which came from that uh, that slave device when it inquired it right about the slave to be paged to determine where in that hop sequence the slave might be listening in the page scan mode. Now, remember there are different uh, frequency hop there is a sequence of frequencies that are used. So, you need to know on which hop sequence the, the slave is going to connect to the uh, master ok. So, that information is obtained from this clock information ok. So, the master now will send a page message after it has determined that ok and the uh, slave will be in what is called as a page scan mode. So, what is a page scan uh, uh, substrate? This page scan substrate indicates that it is listening to the um, to the page messages that are coming from a master. So, waiting for page messages which are coming from a master ok. So, it listens to the package that are addressed to this particular access code ok that is dedicated access code. So, on receiving so, when in the page scan when it receives a page message ok the slave will now enter into the page response substrate and send out a response message. So, it sends back what is called as a page response which will consist of its ID, ID packet uh, which will contain its uh, DAC its access code and then the frequency for the next slot uh, I am sorry it will send this page response frame at the frequency for the next slot from the one on which it received the page message. Now, I will tell you why this um, this is very important. So, what we actually um, see is that since we use a time division multiplexing right the way the time slots are are handled in um, in Bluetooth is, is very interesting. So, what happens is the master and the slaves will alternate use of the time slot. So, which means if the page is sent on a particular time slot the response will be sent on the next slot ok that is what we mean by saying that it is sent at the frequency for the next slot from the one in which the page message was received ok ok. 
So, paging is something like saying will you connect to me ok. So, it is similar to inquire. So, you have still not synchronized the clocks or frequencies ok. So, this is where the actual PicoNet connection with the device is being established ok. Now, this connection process actually involves a 6 step process. So, the first step is where the um, um, a slave ID a message consists of which consists of the slave ID is sent from the master to the slave ok. So, it uses the hopping pattern of the page alright and the uh, pattern source and clock are that of the slave. So, slave I similarly you have another slave ID is sent from the slave to the master ok it is a response page response you have a page and you have a page response. Then there is an FHS which is sent from masters to slave and then slave ID from slave to master which again is a response and then the first master packet which goes from masters to slave then first slave packet which goes from slave to the master. So, this sequence of uh, steps are followed to um, to complete this paging process. So, once this is done the communication is established between the master and the slave and they can start transferring data to each other ok. So, that is what is used. So, this is just an example of uh, paging. So, you can see that um, you know once the paging messages are sent out the response will be sent back by the uh, from a to, so, let us say for instance A and B are getting connected here right. So, that is what we are trying to show over here ok. okay. Now, there are uh, we said that power is a very important aspect right because Bluetooth is meant to be a low power uh, protocol. So, there are various power control modes which are used in Bluetooth ok. So, we have something called a sniff mode. So, this is a low power mode in which the uh, listening activity of the slave is reduced ok. So, you are trying to save power by uh, uh, reducing the listening activity ok. So, what happens here is that the slave will listen for transmissions only at fixed intervals ok. This fixed interval is T sniff at a particular offset uh, at a particular offset slot called D sniff and it will do, do it for N sniff amount of time. So, the number of times it will it will uh, listen to the channel and uh, at what slot it will receive ok. All these are basically parameters which are given by the master when it issues a sniff command to the slave. So, which means you can tell the slave that you can go into sniff mode now and just listen to the transmission at these periods alone. So, you can be in a low power mode until then. So, that is the idea that is used in the sniff mode. Then we have something called a hold mode. Now, in the hold mode um, what happens here is that the slave uh, temporarily does not support any ACL packets right. So, the uh, we talked about two different the asynchronous uh, control link and the synchronous control right. So, the ACL packets are not supported the SCO links may still be supported ok. So, for a particular amount of time say T hold um, amount of seconds it could go into the hold mode of operation. So, what we um, do by allowing by freeing it from doing any any this kind of transmission is that you are making it free to do other things like do scanning or paging or inquiring with respect to another PicoNet. It can also connect to another PicoNet. So, you need some time for it to be able to connect to another PicoNet. So, that is what is um, facilitated by this hold mode of operation ok. But the slave will still keep its active member address that is it has normally each uh, member is given an active member address. So, it will still hold on to that active member address which means it is still part of this PicoNet as such ok. So, another mode that we already referred to earlier was a park mode right. So, this is a very low power mode with very little activity ok. Uh, but the slave is still uh, be synchronized to that particular channel ok and the park slaves will regularly listen for beacon signals at certain intervals and this intervals are decided by the uh, beacon structure which is communicated to the slave during this uh, start of the parking. So, the parked slave has to be informed about a transmission in a beacon channel which is supported by the master to keep the parked slaves in synchronization and then send them any information. So, which means we need some mechanism to inform the parked state that is going to receive some information ok. So, any message to be sent to a parked member is normally sent over a over the broadcast channel. So, it also helps the master to have more than 7 uh, slaves because you can have actually um, because if it goes into the parked mode you can um, and you are after all sending it in a broadcast manner right. So, you can indirectly support more than 7 slaves ok. So, now we have been talking a lot about the frequency hop spread spectrum. So, so ex how exactly that does the frequency hopping take place in Bluetooth? Uh, if you look at that the Bluetooth channel has actually a pseudo random hopping sequence uh, through 79 RF frequencies ok. So, there is you have a band from 2402 to 2480 which is divided into uh, 79 uh, different frequencies and where the channel spacing is of 1 megahertz is the uh, spacing. So, it will hop at a rate of 1600 hops per second 
Okay, so that is the uh, different uh, channels that we will have as such. Okay, so the normal hop rate will be about 1600 hops per second okay, and that is the, so you can see this figure which gives us the time versus frequency at different points of time you will be at different uh, frequency uh, will be used and it is a random sequence right, so which is why we say it is a, a pseudo random hopping sequence is used. So, for every packet there is a um, hop that will take place, Frequ a different frequency will be used. So, uh, packets can be 1, 3 or 5 slots long, okay, that is we said that you know, slots are used, right. So, packets are normally pretty short. So, you can see here that um, if this is using f k, right, so the next slot will be master is using a frequency of f of k, the next slot will be used by the slave, so f k plus 1 will be used by the slave. The next slot will be used again by the master f k plus 2, so you will see that the master will get to use every uh, alternate slot as such. Similarly, the slave will get to use alternate slots, okay. And the duration of a slot is 625 microseconds, so that is the way it is handled, okay. So, and we said that um, it also uses a time division duplex scheme, this alternating of the slots between the master and the slave. So, so let us uh, see how that happens. So, as we said, the channel is divided into consecutive slots of 625 microseconds. So, and one packet can be transmitted per slot, okay. And we said subsequent slots are alternated for transmitting and receiving. So, which means you have a strict alternation of slots between the master and the slaves. Now, the master can send packets um, only in even slots. So, you can send it, send a packet in a, in a, in a slot 2k, right, it is an even slot. So, we say 2k. So, the next slot will be, uh, the next will be given to the slave, the slave will transmit at 2k plus 1 again 2k plus 2 will be given to the master, okay. So, the slave can send packets only in the odd slots and the master can send packets only in the even slots. So, that is how you have a strict um, demarcation between which slots are used by the master and which are, which are used by the slave, okay. So, the whole Piconet channel if you use, okay, we said it is divided into slots, right. So, you can let us look at how this channel is used. So, there are as we said 1600 frequency hops that are done per second with a 1 megahertz RF channel, right. So, in one second you will have 1600 uh, hops which are done, okay. So, now each frame uh, that you have will consist of about 366 bits, okay, that is the um, slot and the payload out of that will consist of um, 366 minus 72 minus 54. Remember the 72 and 54 are part of the header and the synchronization information that is used. So, you have 240 bits that is what is available for carrying the actual payload or the data. So, 240 bits is only about 30 bytes which is why you said small small packets only are carried in the uh, in Bluetooth. So, 30 bytes is what is carried per frame, okay. And uh, the slots can be reserved for voice in the case of a synchronous link, okay. And uh, the frames can occupy up to 5 slots to improve channel efficiency. So, a single frame, okay, you can it can occupy up to 5 slots in order to improve the channel efficiency. And uh, you can have reserved slots and allocated slots interleaved, okay. So, that is normally done. So, uh, for instance, when you have a reservation for uh, synchronous or time bounded information for example, okay. So, let us say you want voice to be transmitted. So, voice normally when you trample and send voice, you will need to trans transmit about 8 bits, 1 byte for every 0.125 milliseconds, okay. If you are looking at sampling voice, right. I may do a sampling at a rate of 8000 samples per second, right. So, every 0.125 milliseconds, one byte will be generated, let us say. So, I need to transmit one byte every 0.125 milliseconds. So, which means uh, 30 bytes for every 3.75 milliseconds, right. And 3.75 milliseconds, right. So, divided by 625 microseconds. Why divided by 625 microseconds? Because that is the duration of a slot, okay. So, you will find that, um, so one out of six slots, right, so that will have to be reserved. So, 6 slots will be required for that, okay. So, that is the way you will have to um, look at reservation of slots, okay. And um, allocation, reserved slots or allocated slots we talked about it. Right? So, reservation is normally done for uh, synchronous time bounded slots. Allocation is done for asynchronous slots and it is on demand, so that can be done, okay. And this allows you to have a collision free polling reservation and allocation mechanism. So, that is the um, reason why we have a very such a detailed uh, time slotting mechanism and uh, frame sequencing and all these frame uh, frequency hopping mechanisms which are used in Piconet, okay. Okay, so uh, this is an example of using the SEO 
uh, slots and the ACL uh, slot. That is the synchronous connection oriented link and the asynchronous connection slots. So, you see that a master sends an SEO um, and in response the slave 1 responds. So, next master sends an ACL. So, let us say it sends it to slave 2, then slave 2 responds, right. Then again master sends SEO, slave 1 responds and so on. So, you can have, you will see that how the 2 will alternate, okay. You can have an SEO with an ACL alternating in between each other, but an SEO occurs at a periodic um, rate because you need, it is a synchronous connection oriented channel, right. So, it is a synchronous uh, mechanism. So, definitely within some amount of time, within a definite period of time, you will get to transmit your SEO amount of data that you will get a channel to transmit the SEO data, right. So, that is uh, basically what is how these things are handled, okay. So, this should give you um, some kind of an overview of how Bluetooth basically works. So, this is a quick comparison between 802.11 and Bluetooth. So, you can see that 802.11 also works around 2.4 gigahertz, same frequency which Bluetooth also uses. So, data rates um, we have um, 1 to 3 megabit per second and also up to higher data rates now in Bluetooth that are being supported. So, range is where we have a difference, it is only 100 meters, up to 100 meters you can have an 802.11 whereas Bluetooth is only about 10 meters. And uh, power consumption is higher in 802.11, much, much lower of the order of milliwatts, right, in the case of uh, Bluetooth. And uh, physical specification, this uses only fre basically frequency uh, hopping, that whereas that supports many other uh, physical uh, channels as well. So, MAC is have, this here is done by means of slots. Slot allocation is a way to share, share the channel, whereas here we have in uh, 802.11, we have the DCF and PCF modes of sharing the channel, okay. And uh, price of course lower for Bluetooth compared to um, 802.11 and application is mainly for short range connections whereas 802.11 is for wireless LAN, okay. So, uh, we have a, you can kind of compare these two technologies in terms of what are their purposes and so on. So, to summarize what we have looked at with respect to Bluetooth is the following, we have looked at the idea of what is called a speaker net, how these speaker nets are formed, how the connection uh, are established, how the connection states are established, what, is the, what happens in the protocol stack how different messages are transmitted and how the uh, time division mechanism is used effectively to um, help the master and slave devices communicate with one another, okay. So, this should give you an overall view of Bluetooth. We have not gone to a lot of details of Bluetooth because uh, it, there, there are a lot more details that one could understand. So, it is kind of a complex protocol in that sense. But with this um, overview, you, sh you should get a feel of how Bluetooth basically works, okay. Thank you.